Thank you for coming, especially this early in the morning. Um, you know, thanks. I want to thank Heidi for allowing me to present again. I also want to thank the living for showing up this early. There's another one now. Um, uh, just a little bit about me. I work at the Aerospace Corporation, um, which you probably already know just from the discussions that have happened here. Um, I got my aerospace air engineering degree from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, both bachelor's and master's. Then I went and worked at General Electric on jet engines for six years. So I was a jet engine designer for a while. Didn't like Ohio, so I moved to Aerospace Cal Corporation in California. And, uh, sorry. <laughs> and uh, then, I, you know, so I've been working on uh, rockets, launch vehicles, large engines, uh, new concepts, uh, that sort of thing. I've been a member of AIAA ever since 1991. Um, I'm a distinguished lecturer through that group also. And uh, Jim has uh, seen that, uh, and, and Jan has also seen my talk uh, that I do through that organization. Uh, last, this just May, I became the chair of the Nuclear and Future Flight Technical Committee, and I'm also on the Pressure Gain Combustion Committee, which is boring rotating detonation combustion stuff. None of the fun stuff like we're doing here. Um, I'm also a, a part-time adjunct professor at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, where in their mechanical engineering department, once a year, I teach a course called Propulsion Systems, which is actually really a lot of fun. And um, I was just talking with uh, Dave here, licensed pilot, instructor, and that kind of thing. So anyway, that's who I am. So uh, I wanted to show you, just before I kick off with the, with the, with the fun stuff, some of the boring stuff, uh, just a little bit about what I do at... Um, at aerospace. This is one of our projects right now that, we're, that I'm supporting um, through DARPA. This is the Boeing Phantom Express, uh, which is a reusable first stage uh, uh, booster. So it's basically the winged answer to the Falcon 9 uh, the, with they, when they bring back stuff. Is this a, a brainchild of Spondle? This, he was the original program manager, but this particular concept has been around with Boeing for 20 years oh. and they've just started evolving and evolving. So yeah, this started off um, about 18 months ago, two years ago, they're in phase two now, they're building hardware. Uh, the difference between this and, another, and the SpaceX uh, version is that this particular one is designed to fly 10 times in 10 days. So that's the, that's the demonstration, that's the program, right? And the last flight of that is going to be to put something in orbit. But anyway, the main engine for this, the thing that's putting out all the hate and corruption at the back end there is, the, is a space shuttle main engine. And uh, one of the things I was uh, very, very lucky to be a uh, part of was um, being at the NASA Stennis test campaign where they tested this engine 10 times in 10 days to show and dispel 30 years of rumors that that engine is unoperable, needs all these inspections, it's unreliable, and we dispelled all those rumors in, in a 10 day series where we ran the engine 100, 100 seconds each time. Yes? Oh, how long was each run? 100 seconds. Okay. Yeah, and then we did two 100 second acceptance tests before that just to make sure everything was good. Yeah? What, what is the payload of that vehicle? Uh, it has, this, it has that, uh, the upper stage on it, which right now the capacity and the payload is still being determined because that part hasn't been designed yet. The DARPA program is to make the, the, the booster only. So I think right now the program is like anywhere between 900 and 3,000 pounds, right? And it goes to, you know, they're, they're still deciding the trajectories and the orbits. What would refurbish on the engine between each test? Nothing. No not, not a thing. I, not a thing. The, the, the air, the air, no, no, not true. That was because of Challenger. This was basically the Aerojet, and the Aerojet Rocketdyne engineers that designed this thing said, we didn't have to do that and here's why. Still a lot of naysayers. Mike Griffin said, show me the money and go prove it and we did. And basically all we did was turn the, we turned this engine around in 14 hours and it was ready to go again. The, t the guys at Stennis had their facility ready to go in 10 hours and they're like, why can't we test twice today? So there was, this engine is fully reliable. Um, and then, again, before I get into the fun stuff... Who says the Russians are masters of rocket science? <laughs> this, if you... Okay, let me, uh, let me start this again. This is the test run, 30 seconds. This is the engine on the stand right here. That's the nozzle. I'm in the test control center parking lot. So this is 380,000 pounds of thrust coming out of here. The biggest, the biggest rainmaker in the world. So anyway, that was just that was just part of the 100-second test. But I figured I'd show you guys just because I think that was pretty cool. How many of these engines are still around? 
Uh, they make the, they're making these engines for SLS. Like they just tested one last week and they tested one two weeks before then. So they're making these engines for the, for the space launch system. But this particular engine was a conglomeration of parts from older engines uh, called a phase two space shuttle main engine, which was the most flown version of the engine in the space shuttle program. Like every space shuttle engine, it was built from parts of other engines. So it, it, the engine would come back, it pulled off the, the orbiter, completely disassembled, and then put back together with parts from other engines, and then retested and fired. And that's exactly the way they did with this one. So every part on this engine already had starts, flight time, and all that stuff. And after 1,200 more seconds, it was ready to do another 1,200. Just a really impressive engine. So, oh, did you have a question? Well, yeah. So is, is it going to be uh, like carrying cargo into space, or is it going to actually take people? It's not, it's not designed for any manned. Okay. It's not designed to have a manned rating. ISP and what's the propellant? Liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, ISP is around 450 some seconds. So. Uh, okay, I'll start uh, with the, the boring stuff now. Okay, so what, um, what you're going to see here, if I can figure out how to do this here from the beginning. Okay, let's wait for the deal to... There we go. Okay, so this is going to be a little different from the, uh, from the prior talks. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, so I'm going to ask you to all have an open mind, especially the physicists here, okay, because I am not a physicist, as I'm going to proudly announce, okay. Um, but, you know, definitely have all of your rocks, rotten perishables, and dead rodents ready for throwing, because I'll be glad to accept all those. Uh, so this is for entertainment purposes only, okay? Uh, you know, so um, you know, just keep that in mind as well. There's going to be a lot of topics covered here, and um, some of it might seem a little disjointed, but hopefully it'll all come together in the end when you're, when you're just waking up from your nap there. Um, so the interesting thing about this talk is I gave this two years ago. Uh, and I learned some information just this past Friday that required me to go in here and reorder things and restructure things. And I'll point that out when I get to that part in the talk. Uh, so there's a lot of, I was putting together a lot of charts during this conference. <laughs> uh, every waking moment I was trying to, uh, to, to cover, uh, to make sure I got this, uh, this ready for today. And there's still some things I wasn't able to get in here. But what I do want to mention though is too, is uh, yesterday uh, Dr. Chow's presentation and, and also from um, Mr. Thompson about different statements that were made that definitely are going to be talked about here. Things like uh, phase change of space-time near black holes, uh, neutron star speed of sound greater than superluminal, space-time as a superfluid, gravity with multiple components to it, wormhole universe and what that might look like on the other side, and charged black holes. We're going to cover and kind of touch on some of those, but keep those statements in mind as we go through some of the crazy ideas that I've been coming up with up here. So, all right. So these are the concepts, or these are the discussion topics. Don't need to really talk about any of these, because um, you're going to see them going through. But um, uh, yeah, we'll just get right into it. OK, so caveats and ground rules. First thing, I am not a physicist. I'm not an astrophysicist. I'm just a plain old engineer. OK, I work on the, the hate and corruption making engines with the fire and all that kind of stuff. Um, these are all conceptual and notional models of the world. All right, so keep in mind this is just a specula speculative you know, set of uh, concepts and ideas, uh, that, but they do have some scientific extensions into SR and GR, uh, cosmological observations, quantum mechanics. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, so where applicable, I'm going to use visual graphical analogs because I like to think in pictures, I like to think in graphics because people have a real natural draw to understand things when there's pictures, right? Picture says a thousand words, you know, Air Force management loves pictures because they don't understand anything else. Um, based solely on conjecture, oh, oh yeah, uh, without the use of mathematics or equations, okay? Uh, because, because I do not have the luxury of speaking in fluent math like you folks do, I try to avoid those things and use it with, do things with pictures and graphics instead, but the math is certainly there, okay? Which, like I said, I don't really know how that all ties together yet. But anyway, a lot of this stuff is based solely on conjecture, implication, inference, and supposition statements like, you know, since, this is, since that's possible, then what if this, or yeah, but, and I'm, I'm going to do all the hand-waving in person, okay, so I don't have to write that on the chart. There's no transformations, no tensors, no reference frames, no Lagrangians, no space warps, sorry, okay, because when I started looking into these things, that stuff just boggled me. And it just was well over my head. And I thought there had to be some easier way that at least I could understand these things that might also be a little bit easier that, that, that more represents nature, at least in my view. Okay? So the tri-space ideas presented here offer a different pr perspective of looking at the answers that everybody is coming up with when you solve these equations. 
So it's not intended to invalidate, challenge, or refute any currently accepted things. And as always, these are just works in progress. Okay, so I'm just going to lay all those ground rules now. Um, and we'll go ahead and start in. Okay, so the genesis of all of this was back in 1989. I was walking through the library at Embry-Riddle, and I was saw this tiny little thin report without a, uh, it was so thin there was no printing on the binding. And it was a paperback, kind of like a cardboard you know, uh, cover. It wasn't even like a hard cover. And I pulled it out, and it was called this, Faster Than Light Particles, a Review of Tachyon Characteristics. And this actually was my uh, first semester when I was taking modern physics. So we were talking about things like this, which is why it was in my head. And it became really interesting when I started reading this, I don't know, 30-page document, okay? Uh, and this was a study done by the RAND Corporation, and it talks about, you know, undiscovered faster-than-light subatomic particles, the properties they must possess if they're to exist without violating the theory of relativity. And also, this author goes on to talk about a potential relationship between tachyons and antigravity. Okay, now, tachyon sometimes is a bad word, all right? It's kind of like the ether, where tachyons, and it's like, oh, it's one of those things we've never seen, and blah, blah, blah. But where, in fact, tachyon is just a family of particles. You can have a tachyon electron, a tachyon proton. It just happens to mean faster than light. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit later. So I read this thing many, many, many times because it had simple algebra in it from, from general and special relativity that I could understand. It was very well written, and I have this electronically so I could send it to anybody that wants it. Um, but I thought about all these ideas, and a lot of things started building off of one another, especially as I started reading and learning about cosmology and astrophysics and particle physics, uh, all from what you could get reading, you know, uh, not from formal textbooks, but what, you know, different discoveries that were made and whatnot. But unfortunately, after all of this time, there's no math, you know, only, and no, you know, there's no, no, no experiments have ever been done. All right, but that's kind of just the genesis of these ideas. So there's a couple key concepts that, that I need to, to go over with you before we can start talking about things like gravity and inertia and charge and all that stuff, is what is tri-space, okay? So the first key concept behind all this comes from the Pusher paper, and it talks about uh, how, what tri-space is, what does that mean? Tri meaning three space, all right, spaces. So first, you take this equation uh, for basically that's a mass, ex mass uh, uh, increase, uh, relativistic mass increase, e, e over m naught c squared, where m naught and all these equations is a rest mass of the particle. Uh, then you combine the two, and then when you normalize with respect to velocity, you get this equation. All right, pretty basic, basic, you know, fa fairly straightforward algebra. So if you plot this equation, you get this. Okay, you get two parabolic uh, curves here. You get uh, and then uh, some hyperbolic quadrants, and on both sides of this. Uh, Energy, uh, energy over m naught c squared line, you have a, uh, an asymptote where v is equal to minus c, v equals to plus c, and this axis along here is the uh, velocity ratio. Okay, so if you're at the speed of light, you're right at that, that point right there. Uh, what if you have negative mass? You have mass, you know, you're looking only at positive mass. Yes. I think, well, that's, I'll talk about that in just a second, but I'm going to dispel that quite quickly. All right, so basically only the upper right represents the, our current thinking because negative energy, as we talked about earlier, you know, Lance had brought this up at, at one point in his questions was, you know, what is it? You know, how, negative with respect to what kind of thing, okay? So that also might be just a matter of convention, so it's kind of like, well, we're not sure what that is. Uh, and then negative velocity, okay, because we're, we're on this side of the, uh, this side of the, uh, of the axis here, that's just more of a matter of convention than anything, right? Deceleration can be looked at as a negative velocity. So we're just going to focus on this area right here, all right? But for all the things I'm talking about, it may also apply to some of these other interesting quadrants and quantities. Being down in the gravity well, technically, negative energy is what is around us. We'll get to that if we talk about gravity and inertia, all right? So, okay, so we are here, right? This is what we see in our known universe, all right? Okay, so if we just look at that upper quadrant, okay, and this is a close-up view of that. Here's the e equal over m naught c squared. Here's the v over c. Uh, for what this basically says, or at least how I've interpreted it, is that for any given energy point, point of energy in space, you can have three possible velocities, subluminal, luminal, and superluminal. Okay, because everything on the left, on the right side of this line is, you know, multiples of the speed of light. All right, this is just based out of the pure algebra from special relativity. So what does that mean? Okay, it means that if, any, if I have an energy, some sort of energy, you know, measurement of energy and mass at a point in space or some sort of quantity there, how does it know whether or not it's super, subluminal, luminal, or superluminal? Okay, so the way I've thought about this is, all right, well, 
we see all the stuff that is not moving at the speed of light, right? This is everything that we see, right? We see, you know, uh, you know, universes, galaxies, you know, water, sand, you and I, that kind of thing. Everything in this realm called subluminal space is called tardions. Tardy meaning slow, tacky meaning fast, right? It's, um, it's just a family of particles. And as, you all, as we all know, as you increase energy, uh, uh, as you increase velocity, the, the energy that you need to go the next increment of velocity is exponentially higher, right? That's the whole point behind relativity, to where V can never attain, you can never accelerate a mass to the speed of light, right? We know that, that's been experimentally proven. Uh, the other thing too is here is, you know, we have real positive rest mass, you know, we can slow down an electron or a proton and measure its mass, okay? Uh, so it has finite, um, uh, finite quantities. The next part here is the luminal plane is what I'm calling it because it actually is like a plane or some sort of never, att never attainable space, but stuff exists here, right? It's things like EM waves, photons, fields, gravity, inertia, all that stuff exists in this particular spatial realm called the luminal plane, otherwise known as luxons, right? Lux meaning light, where you have real energy, obviously, you know, at any of these energy levels, V is always equal to C, not slower, not faster, right? It's always equal to the speed of light in the medium. Um, and uh, the rest mass for these types of things is zero, right? Zero, like a photon. The third part, the third option is this new one, all right? Superluminal space, okay? And this is all coming from things that Pusher has, has, has talked about as well, where in this superluminal space you have these things called tachyons, okay? It's particles that move faster than light. As you increase energy, uh, as you increase energy, you actually slow down to the speed of light, which is bizarre to think of, all right? And as you decrease energy, you can actually attain infinite velocity because the x-axis here because becomes asymptotic. Very interesting, all right? So in this case, uh, you also have imaginary rest mass because you end up with a one over, uh, you end up with a negative square, a square root of negative one, but then if you make your rest mass imaginary, the negatives cancel and everything becomes real again, which is kind of interesting. So you have imaginary rest mass because you can never stop it, right, theoretically. Uh, and then things over here, what I'm gonna say is that we're, the things that exist over here are things like dark matter, dark energy, and quantum effects. And we may get to that if you choose. So, this is the tri space universe. What's that? Uh, Down here? I don't understand why you would make the assumption that dark matter and dark energy would be superluminous. You'll see. Okay. okay. Um, let me get a drink here. <laughs> I got to get through a lot more first. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I'm going to explode. He says you talk faster than the Germans. <laughs> All right, so this is the tri-space universe, subluminal space, separated or with some sort of luminal interface, and then superluminal on the other side, okay? So, we're going to take this and we're going to look at the luminal plane edge on, and we're going to open up and we're going to unfold it looking from the top and looking from the bottom, okay? So, tri-space can be graphically represented as three parallel realms that coexist at every point in space. The luminal interface uh, separates sub and superluminal spaces, and what I'm called, what everybody has been referring to throughout physics as zero point field, quantum foam, physical vacuum, blah, 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 is what I'm calling that plane. All right, everything that goes on and that's, that is uh, uh, proposed to go on in modern physics in these realms, pick your, pick your term, goes on here. Okay, so if I'm going to unfold and look at this thing from the top, I'm going to look at super subluminal space. You've all seen this kind of a diagram before, right, where you have a mass. It kind of distorts this whole thing, and then you have, you know, this is the, you know, the graphical representation of gravity, all right? So the other thing that happens is on the surface here that is being distorted is the actual top of this interface plane where you have waves and photons and particles and fields and so forth. Okay, now... If this luminal plane is basically a separation, again, this is a model, okay? If, this is, if we can model that plane as a separation interface between two spaces, then if you, if you make a distortion or some kind of perturbation in this space, what do you see from the other side in superluminal space? And you might see something like this, okay? So, this means that in superluminal space, if you have a real mass here, like us, or gra uh, you know, galaxies or whatnot, planets, you would see some sort of gravitational distortion, but you wouldn't be able to see the mass. The mass itself, the actual mass, the actual mass energy does not pass through. Now, think about this the other way, too. If, there, if real mass can exist down here, because the imaginaries cancel, and as long as you don't slow to the speed of light, your mass can stay real. If there's real mass down here, it's going to make kind of a bulge up in this area, and we will never see it. 
We will never physically observe the mass. We will only observe its gravitational effects. Dark matter. Okay, so that's one reason, that's one approach to where, what dark matter could be is real mass in this space. Well, I'm just also curious when you go to, go to luminal speed, would you gonna have a straight line with a zip in it with a hole in it? Say that again? Going from point A to point B. You end up with a plane with the hole and the, the bulge in there. Both, I use that model. I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Let me draw a blackboard over there. I can get up there and cut it. <laughs> If I look in the middle of that thing, then I end up with this. Does that have any representation at all? Yeah, that's what I just showed you up here. No, no, no. That's looking at it from the top side versus I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to fold this thing down based on your model. You're happy with this is subluminal? You're happy over here with superluminal? What happens here? I'm still not following you. <laughs> Let me... he's, he's looking at it straight on. Straight edge on. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is supposed to be looking at it edge on. In fact, we'll get to exactly that. Um, that we'll, if, you're, if you want to look at it directly edge on, I'll show you what that means. This again is I'm you know, taking the flat surface and I'm looking up here and then I'm looking down here. Right? But you, I think, Paul, you want to look at it straight edge on. Yeah, yeah and so you would see exactly that. Okay. But well, what would I learn from that? But that's the point. Yeah, okay. That, that, when we get to this, that's where we start talking about gravity and inertia. Okay. So anyway, superluminal space can, you know, and as I just mentioned here, dark matter, dark energy, exotic fields, and exotic matter could all be manifestations of things going on in superluminal space, all right? So this is the tri-space universe, two space times that are bounded by like an interface surface. That's the model. So key concept number two, all right, we're going to put that aside and we're going to go, uh, you know, to another, another batch of ideas called fluidic space-time. And this has actually been around for quite a while, okay? Uh, what I'm proposing, or at least in this model, tri-space can be equated to a fluid-like medium with properties that are analogous to a fluid. And there's been lots and lots of papers on this already. Um, uh, you know, where, you know, the, 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 uh, the, this, the old... Uh, term luminiferous ether was what this was called, right? You know, the Greeks thought that light had to travel through something just like sound travels through something. And then this all got dispelled with Michelson Morley and the advent of quantum mechanics and all that kind of stuff because it was able to answer things that the ether couldn't. But there's also things the ether can answer that quantum mechanics can't, all right? So anyway, in general, what I'd like you to keep in mind is that space-time is everywhere and has the same qualities between galaxies as it does in atoms. It's the same stuff. Between the electron and the proton is existing the same type of stuff as it would have between us and Andromeda. It occupies all volumes at any scale. So there is no such thing as a pure vacuum because inside of that vacuum you will still have these space-time constituents. All right, vacuum we know of as having you know, no electromagnetic radiation or no particles, no mass, but you still have space-time. There's still stuff there, okay? It just may not be acting on it or producing anything that's recognizable. Space-time is also composed of point-like constituent, ent constituent entities, okay? And we'll get to this in a minute, but th that's the third key concept, which we'll talk about in detail. But it basically is the fundamental building block of everything. Because if mass comes out, is an offshoot of space-time, then whatever's building up that mass is made of the stuff that made up space-time, okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Space-time makes up all mass, all energy, and all fields, and it is the transmission medium between all interactions or couplings between those things. That's the medium on which it all acts. And finally, it has different phases or states, kind of like what you were saying yesterday, right? There, there's the possibility that different phases or states of space-time, if it is a fluid-like uh, um, uh, medium, may manifest themselves as the three different realms of tri-space. For example, you know, a more fluid-like medium would be us, subluminal space. A more gaseous medium of this would be superluminal space, but it's the same basic constituents. All right, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit as well. So some of the characteristics that we have, all have used with space-time before in a lot of different research is space-time pressure, right? That kind of term, as you pointed out even yesterday, was the original cause or one of the proposed cause for the Casimir forces, so space-time pressure pushing the plates together, that kind of thing, right? So we, we've already accepted that space-time has kind of this pressure on other things. Uh, space-time is easily distorted and displaced by the motion of mass. It does not take a planet to move space-time because I'm walking across the room here, 
right? I am, you know, even at the small atomic level, when you have materials and compounds that are being formed, all that space time of the, within those atoms is merging together to make something else. It's not hard, all right? But what is important is that you can also m distort space time and s displace it in favor of different, different uh, conditions of space time, which becomes very important later. But this is the, you know, these are the effects of gravity inertia that we're going to see. Space time has a density and a compressibility. And I think this is also notions that have been accepted where you have energy densities within a particular vacuum state and so forth. So that all is there. But something like compressibility, something like what goes on here at a shock wave, may also be present, right? Is when, when you start accelerating masses, you start compressing space time in front of it, and that changes the whole distortion, which you can end up seeing as a, as a special relativity. Uh, it also has viscosity and viscoelastic qualities. Now this is something a little bit new, uh, where it offers a resistance to flow. All right, so it has a resistance like, you know, like any fluid does, where it, it has a certain resistance to any change in motion or any kind of perturbation. So in this particular model, where space-time is fluid-like, it may have those qualities as well. That actually is the cause of gravity and inertia that I'll, I'll show later. And also, when you have these kind of characteristics, you can also get boundary layers and vorticity around massive objects or within certain fields, where one, one of these little space-time constituents affects the others. All right, and so when you move one, you start moving the others, commonly known as frame dragging or lens stirring type of effects. It's like a boundary layer type of phenomenon. Okay, so the phases of space-time, I mentioned this earlier uh, where, you know, based on its fluidic nature, subluminal space might be a high pressure supercritical phase. Uh, right here, right? You know, I took one of my favorite beverages and turned it upside down. Okay, so, you know, and you know, because this is essentially kind of what it's like. You have a, a high pressure dense phase up here. You have some, some kind of interface plane where it's not sure what it is, like the head of a beer or soda, if we're correct. Uh, and then superluminal space down here where there's a very different, you know, very different types of, uh, of fluidic qualities. So, you know, this is where all the luminal stuff goes on. This is where the superluminal is and obviously, uh, you know, subluminal up here. There may be things like triple points critical points, there might be some other transition point, perhaps in a black hole where you go from one to another, or the space-time changes phase. I don't know. I'm guessing at all this. You know, so it might have a triple point-like behavior. Who knows what causes particular um, constituents of space-time to be in the phase that they're in. I don't know. Okay. All right. So, key concept number three. I mentioned several times before about key constituents of space-time. Now we're going to talk about that. All right. So we first talked about what tri-space is. Now and then we talked about what space-time is. Now we're going to talk about what space-time is is. Okay. So the same. The, this researcher, Richard Gautier, who's a, who's a physicist um, at Santa Rosa State Co Santa Rosa Junior, Co Junior College in California for a long time now has been proposing a very unique model of the electron and the photon that is comprised of a point-like entity that traces a closed path on itself or spirals through space to make either the photon or the electron. Okay? This is the information that I got on Friday after seeing a YouTube video of his from this presentation that he gave in Belgium uh, last month where he presented a much more evolved model than what I was used to of this. Okay. So, you know, basically what he's saying is that the photon is a double helix superluminal uh, structure uh, that corkscre corkscrews its way through space. And when you split these two, these two point-like entities apart, they form an electron and a positron. And with his model, he is able to match the frequencies, the wavelengths, the spins, the charge, the magne magnetic moments, the zitterbewegung of the electron, and all of that. All right, which is really, really something. So what he proposes these little entities are, are called subluminal energy quantum, otherwise known as an SEQ, okay? So what does his model of the photon look like? All right, his model of the photon looks like this, where you have these two SEQs. One is a positively charged SEQ, one's a negatively charged SEQ. They're held together by the Coulomb force, and they rotate around each other, and they corkscrew through space-time like a drill bit, okay? The interesting thing about this is that the, the, the tangential and the axial, or I should say longitudinal velocity components of the spiral are the speed of light. But the actual path speed along the path is greater than light. Superluminal, all the time. Which is very interesting, because that means that light is inherently superluminal. It's caused by a an, ent an entity that's moving at a, su at a superluminal velocity, but we see one side of that, 
the axial, which is light speed. And that superluminal velocity, because of its C, it's C, tan, it's C for tangential and C for axial, is square root of 2. I forgot a 4 there. But anyway, it's the square root of 2, the speed of light. So what he proposes later on in, that pr in the presentation is that if you take these two um, Coulomb and quantum entangled SEQs and you separate them, you end up with an, a, a minus one, uh, you end up with an electron and a positron, and each one of those SEQs manages to trace, on, trace its path on the, on the surface of a horn torus. And a horn torus is like a donut where you can't see through the middle. All right, so this, t this SEQ wraps around the outside and comes back through the middle at the speed of light, then accelerates again, comes back through at the speed of light, then accelerates again. That, ent that path, as it winds its way around, that ball that you see of all of this one single entity making this is the electron. Does that make sense? Or do you, I should say, is it, are, you, are you with me? What's that? What is a torus? Is a, is a donut without a hole? It's a donut where the, the radius at the, at the center from the center line of the, the, is zero. It has no, it, you know, the internal surfaces touch each other. Does that make sense? I mean, do you understand what I'm talking about? I understand. Okay, yeah. Now, in his prior model... It's a donut with some bonus dough in it. Yeah, it's a donut, yeah, without the hole. You know, but then, you know, if you start pulling that apart, then you end up with more of a, what do they call that, a... Uh, it's a different kind of torus, but it, it has a name for it, you know, regular torus. Yeah, donut. <laughs> so, um, like I said, whenever he does this, and he takes this TEQ at the speed that it's going wrapping around here, he can match the measured charge spin vibration and uh, mass and radius of the electron and the positron, which is pretty darn remarkable. But what's interesting about all of this, photons and electrons, is that if this model holds true, that means that on, on, in any other part, if he can extend this model and validate it for any other particles, all matter and EM waves are fundamentally based on superluminal motion of these little entities of space-time. Very interesting, okay? So that infers, again, I'm full of inferences in this one, fundamental particle of space-time medium and all known phenomenon are made out of these SEQs because the SEQ is making up the photon, it's making up the particle, it could make up quarks, more of them get together, make up a particle that we see at a larger scale as a proton or a neutron, but at the fundamental core of everything are these SEQs, okay? So they're everywhere. They're massless, but they give rise to gravitational mass, kind of like what, what Gautier showed back here, right? It, it, it turns from something massless into something with a measured mass, all right? Uh, they dynamically interact and influence the orientation and direction of one another through the viscous fluidic processes that I was mentioning before about the fluid-like nature of space-time. So what, I'm gonna, what I may show later, if I have time, is that charge and magnetic fields and gravity and all of that stuff is a very continuum field-based, as we all know, <coughs> excuse me, field-based type of physics, where one thing can happen, but what we see is the effect of all the others we see as a field of some kind, whether it's magnetism, gravitational, or charge. Mass, charge, magnetism, photons, and all these other things can be modeled as fluid-like phenomenon, keep in mind the word modeled, okay, in all the three tri-space realms based on the orientation and path of these SEQs. What I mean by this last statement is that the SEQs, these, this space-time in the model, can travel along the surface of the interface between the two spaces or down through the interface. So if we're in superluminal space and we see something going down through, we only see one side, we see one kind of a sink or a source type of field. But if we see them moving around the surface, we see kind of a dipole type of system. We see both ends of this, all right? We'll, we'll get to that later maybe if we have time and get into charge. When the double helical photon splits into an uh, electron positron, what is the velocity of those now real particles? You mean actually as they move through space? Yeah, yeah. after they've formed. That's, that, that's determined by the wavelength of the photon it came from. Okay. Yeah. Now, in, in Richard's model, this, and, you know, I've, I learned all this on Friday, and I had a conversation with him Friday. So, you know, everything, I'm, I'm just kind of being the middle man with very little pass-through in my own head. Um, the radius and the distance between these SEQs is the frequency of the photon. All right. The tighter the frequency, the higher the wavelength, or you know, the tighter the frequency, the smaller the radius. I should say, All right? I think. All right. But then it, you know, you still have the same velocity components. They're just they're just much closer together. Then they also grow apart depending on the energy that created them. Okay. But they're held together by a, the Coulomb force. And again, in his calculations which I also have the presentation and can share with anybody. Uh, he goes through all the H bars and H's and lambdas and C's and all that stuff and, and says, yeah, here, it works, okay, at least in this model. That's but, a testable 
hypothesis. I think so. Yeah, but we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that a little bit. Okay. So um, yeah. So I'll just leave that at here. Okay. Um, and we'll go to the next one. All right. So we're done with the key concepts. Now I'm going to spend a, a minute or two talking about this luminal interface business. Okay. What is this? This is the the space or the the uh, realm that where the two interfaces join, kind of like the head of the beer. All right. So. The aluminum interface between spaces can be modeled as a surface, modeled as a surface that supports everything. All mass, EM energies, and waves and particles. Uh, it has permittivity, permeability. It determines the speed of light based on the density and, you know, the, the what is it, little epsilon and little mu. Uh, but what's also interesting is that if it is a fluid-like medium, it may also have a surface tension-like quality. Okay, now this is a different concept because if you have a surface tension-like quality, you can do things to the surface of this of surface without affecting the bulk underneath. Okay, so that means you could have these small little perturbations on the surface that kind of look like gravity but really aren't gravity. Okay, and that's why I'm calling this, in quotes, quantum gravity. All of those effects may go on on the surface of this interface without doing any, any real displacement of the mass or of space-time to, 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 to be massful. Uh, space-time may also act like a meniscus between, space, between spaces and around other masses, right? They, you know, kind of like what you showed, Ray, yesterday about the helium, right? That looked like a huge, giant, you know, live meniscus, right? Well, space-time would do the same thing around mass energy. It would have a meniscus where you would have these surface tension-like qualities going on at, the, at that level. Another concept is that it has a thickness. This is not just a planar realm. This actually has a thickness, like I, like I showed you with the head of, of a beer. Okay? It has some thickness to it where there's a different density at the top and a, and a different density at the bottom. Things change in between as they go from one space or one phase to the next. Uh, but this is really, um, uh, you know, as I mentioned here, uh, it's fluidic properties different from either space. But this is the key concept for tri-space models of gravity and inertia. Because if there is a thickness here, that means this is where the displacement occurs whenever you have gravity. And I'll talk with you about that a little later. SEQs can travel along the sub or superluminal super interface boundaries or through the interface thickness. That's what I was mentioning before about you can have stuff moving along the surface of the table and going down through the table at the same time. Or kind of coming up and doing a diagonal, right? Um, you know, where it kind of rides along the surface, goes back down underneath into superluminal space, comes back up, okay? So there's all sorts of ways that these SEQs can move within the dynamic interface of the, uh, between the two spaces. The only thing that can't pass through is mass. All right, mass cannot pass between spaces, but gravitational energy can. All right, and this is kind of what I was saying before about if you have a mass, like you know, real mass, it distorts this whole surface, it distorts this plane, but it doesn't drop through into superluminal space. Okay, same reason why we can't accelerate to 0.999c and then turn on the big thruster and jump right over into superluminal, the superluminal realm. It doesn't work that way. Okay. So, but gravitational energy can. It can be moved. The surface can be, dis, can be, can be uh, fluctuated, but mass energy can't pass through. So this preserves the conservation of mass and, ener and energy within tri-space, because if you have mass in one space, it's producing gravitational energy in the other. So the energy is overall conserved, whereas if you look at subluminal space or superluminal space, you would say it's not if you all of a sudden take one mass and put it in the other space. All right, so if you take a real mass in subluminal space and switch it into superluminal space, we would see the gravitational energy of that mass, but we wouldn't see the mass anymore. But we'd still see some sort of energy signature of the gravity that would be replaced, that the mass replaced. Anyway, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit too. So there are exchange mechanisms believed to exist, all right, in, at least in my head, about why this all, where, how this all goes. Okay, so now I'll, I'll say a, a, a couple charts about superluminal mass. So again, these are, this is a chart right out of that same report I showed to you earlier from Ed Pusher. All right? He talks at the very end, or close to the end, about, okay, now that I've done all this algebra and all this uh, uh, graphing about momentum and time and vectors and causality and all this, here is the bottom line of what tachyons must have if they're going to exist. They, are, they have imaginary rest mass. We covered that. They go faster than light, always. We covered that. They can either have a plus or minus relativistic mass, and who knows what negative mass is, so I'm just going to look at all the pluses. All right? They have real energy. They have real momentum. They have imaginary proper length and a proper lifetime, which is by default. Right? You can never slow them down to the speed of light. They, have, they may have infinite speeds. The more energy you take out, the faster they go. Seems weird. Okay? 
tachyons still have momentum in that case. Uh, an observer, uh, you know, as long as the observer is moving less than the speed of light, they have real time. Uh, and then they also appear to have, um, you know, they have a, a, a you know, length and time reversal. They do not have length changes or time reversals as long as everything remains positive. So it's a really interesting thought that, the ta that you can have something that's almost like you and I and matter existing in a superluminal realm where every velocity is with relative to each other is faster than light. That's just weird to think of. I mean, it's very difficult to wrap your head around that. But anyway, the bottom line is that superluminal particles can have real mass, real energy, and all this, uh, and mass can exist over there. All right, and we're not sure exactly what that looks like, okay? But again, these additional, you know, these are all just additional inferences based on the, you know, the paper here. So now a chart on superluminal space. What goes on over there where these masses interact? Well, we kind of already mentioned these two, these, these first couple, right? Velocity greater than C, imaginary proper mass, um, you know, uh, the you know, rest state of s the speed of light, which isn't really rest because it's still moving. As energy decreases, uh, velocity increases. So how much energy can you take out? Don't know, all right? Uh, e and EM energies exist at the unattainable state of V equals C, so photons and EM can be viewed as stationary. That's weird. All right, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how that would work, but what does that, you know, obviously what does it mean, right? Can photons and EM emitted in superluminal space be observed? I don't know. Uh, how does this affect detectors, guidance systems, and all that stuff? Because everything that we've designed and built in this space is based on the speed of light, not superluminal. So how do we detect something that's superluminal when our, all of our detectors are based on the laws of sublight, the, the sublight realm? And if these are stationary forces, can we use this for propulsion? Is there a way to push off of them, so to speak, right? Because one of the, you know, it's like, you know, right now we're trying to row with the current, which is moving at the speed of light. We're trying to row faster than that or up to it, and it's very difficult. But in the super light realm, that speed of light, that current is considered a stationary pond. So we might be able to go ahead and just easily move through that in some way. I don't know, but just a thought. So the large velocities of superluminal mass implies that for a given energy state, superluminal mass may, may occupy an immense physical space to maintain that, that relative velocity always being greater than the speed of light. It might be huge. You know, a superluminal electron might, might be the size of the Earth. I don't know. Because when you have particles that far apart, they have to maintain that kind of a, you know, greater than light velocity in, uh, uh, to maintain their, their, their place in their superluminal space. Again, I don't know. I'm just all pure conjecture and, you know, here's the hand waving. Proud to do it, okay? All right, trans-space dynamics, how the spaces interact. Uh, trans-space universe is a vast sea of SEQs. Each, can, each, you know, each, one, each uh, SEQ can follow one of three sets of physical laws. They're massless. They do not experience relativity or causality because they're actually in, you know, a, you know, a part of this luminal interface plane. Uh, the trans-space mass energy relation, I sort of already uh, related, uh, talked about this, where mass and gravitational energy are theoretically interchangeable, and that's what conserves the uh, you know, mass and energy in the universe as a whole, not just in one individual space, okay? The, Clark state of, the quantum state of matter and space times determines what space mass exists, and I have no idea what the mechanisms behind that are. Uh, but quarks and photons may be able to freely jump between the spaces because if the photon has a superluminal particle that's associated with it, it's already doing this, this, this transfer between spaces. All right? Gravity is the only currently detectable phenomenon that can be observed and felt in both spaces simultaneously. All right? So where, there, where there's mass in one creating gravity that we see, the other space also sees a gravitational influence, but doesn't see the mass, so that but they still see the gravitational influence. Gravity attracts mass in the same space, which we all know, but repels mass in the adjacent space, which is interesting, because it means if we have a mass in superluminal space, it's going to make a repulsive mound, so to speak, or a hill that we would see as a repulsive gravitational signature, but we wouldn't be able to see the mass, which is really interesting, okay? And same, same here, right? We're, we, all of the mass in our space is creating repulsive type of uh, gravitational in energy in superluminal space where it's pushing superluminal matter away from us. Uh, time proceeds forward and concurrently in, in both spaces. Uh, the, thi the, the thing I was trying to wrestle with this morning was how time gets more involved with this. Uh, two years ago, at this very same conference, I woke up at 4.30 in the morning with this epiphany and how to bring time and model that in tri-space. And I was in the bathroom writing on a napkin so my wife and kid weren't getting woken up. And I came here and I made a drawing on there and I lost that and I kept the napkin. 
And when I was coming, getting ready to come here, I'm like, oh, I'll make that chart on my way over there. I forgot the napkin. It's at work. So, so I, have, I forget what the epiphany was, all right? But anyway, it, there's a way to bring time and how to model time using this construct. Not, you know, but, you know, anyway. Did you have a question? Somebody did. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I either answered it or, it's, or, or my explanation was just too silly for you to continue asking, right? Okay. Yeah, that, that, we might want to mark that. <laughs> okay. All right, so a recap of tri-space basics. I forgot to turn that to the color I was hoping to turn it to. So never mind, that's just, we'll, cover, we'll just go over this. Pay no attention to the, uh, the red stuff. That was for me to try to go fix. Okay, key concept one, tri-space universe is two space times separated by a luminal interface plane that has a thickness to it. Uh, notice lots of my use of air quotes here. Space-time masses and fields are fluidic phenomena with both sub and superluminal components. Key concept number three, SEQs are the fundamental constituent of space-time and everything, all right? Everything is a resultant of some fluid-like interaction thereof, of these SEQs. Superluminal mass has imaginary proper states, but real observable states. Gravity is currently the only detectable phenomenon that we can see in both spaces. Uh, we just went over this, and then we talked about the trans-space uh, mass-energy relation. Okay, so now that you are completely understand and are fully on board, 100% ready to go verify all this, let's talk about what we can explain with this model. All right, how much time do I have, Heidi? 15 minutes. Good, perfect. Okay, what's that? I know, I know. I'm going to try to maybe hit, I'm going to hit one of these. So you guys pick. All right, of these ones in white, what one would you want me to cover? And I can tell you which one I'd like to cover. Motion and travel. Charge, magnetism, and photons. <laughs> that's the one I was thinking of. That's the one I was going to, I was just saying, that's, I have one in mind I think would be more appropriate for this conference, and I think it's going to be that one. So what are you, is everybody okay doing that? This presentation covers has charts for all of this. So if there's any, anything afterwards you want to talk about, I'm going to refer you to this. Again, you can have the charts you know, and, and see all this for yourself and, and have a good laugh in private. But anyway, we'll go to gravity and inertia. Now, I wrote a paper on the, this whole construct back in 1998 for AIAA. I wrote it again with the uh, mentorship and encouragement of Paul Murad for the STAFE conference back in 2004. But in 2002, I wrote a paper in AI, for AIAA that takes this tri-space model and talks about gravity and inertia. So you, I can send you the paper and present it at a joint propulsion conference. Okay, so we're going to go through all this uh, all this stuff about um, you know, faster than light travel, all that boring stuff we're not concerned with, uh, comparison to this. Okay, gravity and tri-space. So, I want you to keep in mind all that stuff that you, that you that might have filtered in and is still in your head after 45 minutes of me talking. All right, so, space-time uh, models gravity as resultant reactions to the presence of mass, okay? When sufficient mass exists in a local region of space-time, it will distort and displace the luminal plane. That's a key concept right there, thereby creating two gravity wells. I've not seen this in any other type of model where I've only seen the one where, you know, you have the ball and you have the distortion, okay, you know, in, in the sheet or in the surface. But in this model, there's a second well. The second well is the displacement of, of space-time in that thickness area that moves it out of the way in favor of mass energy. Okay, now here's an easy analogy for this. Memory foam. Okay, you've all seen them or heard about memory foam, right? If you put your hand on memory foam and you push down into the memory foam, there's two things that happen. The first thing that happens that you see is that the, the rest of the memory foam around your hand kind of caves in towards your hand, right? Now, take your hand out, and you will see two things. You're not only going to see that distortion that was there, but you're going to see an imprint of your hand. Because what you've done is you've displaced and you've changed the density and you've moved out of the way the foam that made up that cell and that is those, uh, that, where your hand was in that area. You've moved it and shaped it into a different form. And so you've created two holes or two wells. And that's exactly what I'm proposing here is, 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 uh, is what's happening with mass and uh, the creation of gravity and inertia. So not only does mass distort displace time, but if it's sufficiently high, it moves it out of the way. Okay, or I should say it, it changes its, uh, it, it, it moves the unmassed space time in favor of the mass space time. So the primary gravity well is from the space time displacement. That's this one down here. Uh, 
Oh yeah, there's the ball. Okay. So here's that view you were looking at, Paul, right? I think you were trying to look at space-time edge on, right? So here's super, subluminal space. Here's superluminal space. Here's the thickness of space-time right here, that luminal interface plane, right? This right here, where the ball actually sits in this thickness and thins it out a little bit, all right, right down here, is what is what's called the prime what I'm calling the primary gravity well where space-time has been displaced. It thins out the surface of space-time around a mass. All right, and I'm going to talk about that it's only observed during acceleration. The second, pro the second one is the, the secondary gravity field is the curvature that we've all known and love. That's the G, that's the meniscus, that's the curvature of space-time that everybody models with the mathematics and all the stuff. Okay? This is what we see. We don't ever see this unless we accelerate something. That's when it becomes apparent. Okay, now, gravity and inertial forces rely on the fluidic properties of the bulk and the viscoelasticity of this whole system in here, space-time surface. So this distortion bit up here can be felt far away. That's what we know, right? That's whole, the gravitational in, in, gravity in our universe. But, uh, it's minimally affected by, by individual SEQs, unlike charge and magnetism, all right? Which is why you can pass charge and magnetism through gravity. And it doesn't change gravity all that much because all that charge and magnetism is riding on the surface. It's not trying to make any kind of a, a, a second dimension, you know, poke through. Uh, SEQ densities will change around a gravitational mass. Okay, we already sort of covered that. So how does this work with inertia? How does this all tie in with inertia? If you have a stationary mass, this is what you see, right? There is no inertia here. You, all you see is this secondary distortion. That's what you observe. But inertia comes when you, also, when you try to move that mass. All right, now if you take that hand that was in your, the, your hand that was in the memory foam and you try to move it, it's not going to move very easy. Right? Because it's trapped by the rest of the mattress. It's trapped by the rest of the foam. So you have to lift your hand up and move it over somehow. You have to reduce the weight of that and move it. Then it becomes, you start to ride over the surface of it, then you can push down again. Okay? Same thing happens in space-time with this primary distortion. So because of the resistance of space-time to move, just like trying to move your hand in the, in the mattress, that is offering a resistance to the motion of mass, which is what we know of as inertia. So what I'm basically saying here is that inertia is a purely local space-time phenomenon that exists only around the area of a mass or within the mass. It has nothing to do with distant matter. It is purely a local phenomenon in, in space-time. So here we are at, at t equals zero. Here's our stationary mass. Here's the secondary distortion, the primary gravity well. Then something, has, something moves, right? It tries to move out of this gravity well, but it still has the shape of itself, so to speak, left behind. So in this particular model, it wants to go back. It wants to, it wants to go back into itself because the space-time ahead of this cannot move out of the way fast enough because it has viscosity and it has a time lag to it. So what happens then is that at t slightly greater than zero, this mass sort of kind of comes up out of its gravity, out of this primary distortion, and tries to move in space. Hold on one second, John. Then at some later time, the, the space-time says, oh, okay, this mass moved, I need to move out of the way because here it comes, and also I need to start filling in behind myself, you know, behind the mass to, to, to make up that space. Now another analogy for this is, oh, there's the memory foam, okay? Another analogy for this is a boat on a lake, okay? A boat sitting on a lake, speedboat, right? You're just sitting there, and all of a sudden you go full throttle. What's the first thing that happens? The nose of the boat comes out of the water, the back of the boat goes down, and as you accelerate, you see this big hole behind the boat. The water is trying to fill where it was. Everything goes to the back of the boat. That's inertia in this model. Everything goes back to where it was because you're making a hole or you're making a, dis a dent in space-time that's actually fairly large. It's the shape of the mass, all right? So once you establish a steady state, though, the boat rides on surface of space-time and everything's fine. So in a, in, a, in a sense, inertia is the resultant effect when it climbs out of its own primary gravity well and the space-time resist changes, its, in, changes in its topology based on its viscous nature. So the bottom line is that there could be gravity without inertia, right? Something just sitting stationary, but there cannot be any inertia without gravity. Yeah, John. <clears throat> Two things. One of them, viscous is the wrong, wrong word because it involves dissipation of energy associated with motion. And you have no energy dissipation here. So maybe not. Energy. Maybe we do. I don't know. And right. The other thing is that Newton, Newton's law, law is that things at rest remain at rest. Things in motion remain in motion. You, you have explained why it's hard to move, but you haven't explained why when, once you start moving something, it keeps on moving. Yeah, well. Right there. 
T plus the, the, the four. Uh, it keeps going. Can I rephrase what yeah. you're going back to Aristotle? Basically, the natural state of motion is rest. Because once you have viscosity, yeah. you come back to rest. Yes. So, but, then, uh, then how you but, but again, if you remember back during when we talked about the phases of tri space, yeah. The luminal plane can be represented or modeled as a superfluid type of medium where viscosity doesn't truly exist. Okay. However, this is space-time. We know that kind of we know that we know that that's true for fluids, right? If we're modeling space-time to have fluid-like and the, the like part with the air quotes and the underline and the bold face is the primary thing here. This is the fundamental constituent of everything. So it may have different properties where energy dissipation may occur. You know, we may, it may have some other effects that, that get spread to the two spaces that don't reflect as, um, uh, as you know, that reflect as energy dissipation or that, that go to the, what you had just addressed about, you know, some sort of things have to come to a stop, kind of, right? Because, and, um, you know, again, hand waving, <laughs> right? But I just wanted to throw this out there to see if it was, you know, but is it, did you have another comment? No. Okay. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. And, and, and if viscous is the right... It doesn't have anything to do with this. Um, you, you showed a slide from this document that said that the uh, this, that um, tachyon is going to have is have real mass, yep. real, real momentum. If I take the velocity and multiply it by imaginary mass, I get an imaginary momentum. Um, so how can it be real? I will send you the paper for from Pusher, and you can take a look at that. He does all of that mathematics in there. You know, that's that's the whole math. It does have real momentum. There's a there's a law that says uh, from uh, special relativity that says that the total energy squared is equal to the momentum squared plus the mass rest mass squared. Okay. That means that there's a magic momentum <coughs> which cancels out the rest mass, and so you can have an object that has costs you no energy at all to make, but has momentum. So there there you have a tachyon drive and move you through space without costing you any energy at all. Perfect. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, we'll see you, see you next year. <laughs> all right, so um, uh, let's see. Okay, other inertia-related physics. Okay, now I mentioned, uh, well, hopefully you kind of see what I'm talking about here. So when I hear things about the Mach effect, you know, I'm th you know, that's all this right here. But when I think about inertia, that's this right here, all right? So this statement right here is actually pretty interesting, and I don't know if this is true or if it's been falsified, but in the moment of acceleration, an object would weigh less because it's actually coming out of its gravitational well. So what does that mean? I don't know. What's that? Does that mean that the inertia is not instantaneous? That's, it, well, it means the displacement of the mass is instantaneous, but it changes the distortion. It basically, it's like when you had your hand in the memory foam and you want to move it, you have to raise it up a little bit. You have to lessen the pressure down on there to move it. And you're still riding up on the distortion that your hand made, right? But does that mean that like, inertia is different? Uh, like it has some like, timeline? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that was, when we get to the experiment parts, when we get to experiments, we'll talk about that, okay? Um, Can I make another comment? Yeah. I'm trying to get my head around this. I'm thinking that if you have a silver that's really deep in the water, sometimes the, the water can get hot, like a thermal thing, and then mm -hmm. the silver will sink because it's less, the, the water gets less dense. Yeah. The silver sinks, it's like the silver got heavy. Uh -huh. And as there are areas where the water gets denser or colder, and the silver rises. And again, it might, it might feel like the silver is simply got lighter. So it's not even the density of the Yes. Yeah, exactly. You're changing the density through here, right? I'm just thinking when this thing is moving, these things might move under it. And yes. It's not a domino thing that will start to keep on rolling. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's it, yeah. It that that's one way of looking at it for sure. Again, I'll take any and all ideas for this. Okay, but uh, go ahead, Jose. We'll, do, we'll before I move on. Do you have enough time for a one minute question? Yes. I don't know. Are your questions typically one minute? <laughs> well, that would be fast. Go ahead. You want me to go ahead with it? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. In uh, string theory, there are extra dimensions which are compactified, and uh, they are uh, much smaller than our dimension. Yeah. And therefore, uh, we cannot go into into those uh, extra dimensions or yeah. other universes. Yeah. Now, as I understand the way that you look at this uh, surface boundary, where the speed is equal to the speed of light. You, you had a picture of a spaceship that went from uh, subluminal to superluminal. So you conceive of a spaceship going through this, is that correct? 
The way that that, the, the, you mean, you, now you're talking about faster than light travel? I'm, I'm saying, can you conceive of a spaceship with people like you going faster than light and going through this boundary? Yes. Okay, now if you can conceive of going through the boundary, where is that boundary? Where is it here? Where is, where is that boundary where that, you, that you're representing? It's, it's right at the interface of the mass energy. No, I'm, I'm saying where in space and time is it? Because if you are able to cross it with a spaceship, yeah. it means that it has a reality just like... Uh, yeah. the, Again, this is a model. Just, just yeah. like the interface between uh, America and the, and the Atlantic Ocean. This is a coast and you can go to it. So in your model, if you can, if you can go through it, where, where is that boundary? Where is that coast? It's right against the mass. Wow. It's, that's, that's the, remember I was saying about a meniscus-like property? Yeah, but I, I, my question is where it should, be, it should have a location in space and time. It's right up against the surface of the mass. <laughs> what, whatever, wherever that is. I'm not sure. I, I mean, we can talk a little bit later. I just want to finish this because I know I'm, I don't have very much time left. So, um, one minute. Okay, well, I'll come. Uh, maybe, you know, if anybody wants to talk to me about this, this is basically quantum gravity right here and, and also special relativity and why we see mass increase. Okay, but anyway. Uh, so this is gravitational fields. Again, there's more of this. What's interesting about here is that I don't know if there's any conditions where E over M naught C squared is less than 1. That would be a very interesting state. But we don't see that in this subluminal realm because everything we end up at, where the, our lowest point of that is where that ratio is 1. However, in superluminal space, it, it represents a whole other realm of energy possibility that we could never observe. So that's interesting to think of right there. All right. Um, this is charged magnetism, photons, that all. This all I all need to change because of the new information I learned about the photon uh, from Richard Gauthier. So this is all not correct. Uh, that's why it's in red up there. Uh, dark matter, dark energy, dark tri-space. Well, how black holes contribute to, contribute to dark matter. It's the universe. It's a choke flow system between spaces. Makes dark matter halos. Possible experiments and predictions. Um, characterize the time lag of space-time. That'd be great for someone to do, like what you'd said. Okay? How long does it take for space-time to react to the motion of a mass? We have no idea. We think it's the speed of light. might be instantaneous. I don't know. All right? Um, it's a gravitational wave, and we know how fast they travel. It's not a gravitational wave. It's different. Remember, this is this is the displacement part, all right? There's, you know, the, the, the water will not fill in the hole behind the boat the same way that waves travel. What a gravitational wave. Yeah. What's that? The point is that, like, we can measure the, the effect of how fast the space time will, will move um, by measuring the speed of, or the speed of the, the propagating wave of the wave, right? Maybe, yeah. I mean, if that's true, then that's cool. Um, you know, we'll, we can talk about that more, but I think there's something to this, okay? Uh, I have a question here. I'm trying to figure out. Uh, I, have, I guess you're going too fast for me, but that, that's, that's okay too. <laughs> if I had a, a body in this, as a subluminal, a superluminal area, and he did hit the space time continuum, we would then have a bump. Would we characterize that bump as anti gravity? Yes. Okay. We would see it as anti gravity. I'll talk about that in just a second. All right. I'm afraid you would. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we could test kaluza klein theory for the existence of this fifth dimension, which I'm going to call superluminal space. Lance actually proposed doing this back in 2016 with the time dilation effects of charged clocks, which actually Martin is, I think, going to look at. Um, not, I mean, he's doing, he was doing that separately from Lance's uh, thing. Further examination of Gauthier's model of the electron and the photon to see if those are actually valid, right? If you can actually re re reproduce other particles and so forth with that model of this uh, SEQ. And then, you know, anything I've talked about here is a subject for experimentation, you know, and then you guys might know how to approach that. Comments based on tri-space, um, a common set of physical laws to exist to all scales of the universe, and I think they're very fluid-like. I think that the, what we're seeing in cosmology and what we see in quantum mechanics is obeying the same basic set of physical laws, but at, the, at different scales. I think nature wants to maintain some sort of simplicity, right? So how we understand those laws and how the mathematics falls into address those I think is, you know, is obviously very different, very complicated, but I think underlying that it all behaves kind of like a fluid-like system. Gravity and inertia are resultant effects of space-time, the presence of mass energy, gravity and inertia cannot be manipulated or controlled by EM forces because they are resultant effects of just mass energy. Whatever you do with E and M that's riding on the surface, riding on the top of the table, isn't going to make the table start distorting and folding up. 
So I'm proposing that EM forces aren't going to do that. There is no gravito electromagnetic coupling. There might be in the equations, but in, in real time I'm proposing that's not going to happen. And then uh, we already talked about this inertia one here. Uh, predictions, dark matter will be found to be, gravi we didn't cover this part about dark matter, but it's going to be gravitationally repulsive. Uh, it's found to have both rotation and linear motion. It's very large. It's the cause of dark energy. Um, quantum mechanics will be found not to be so much instantaneous, but highly superluminal because of the, maybe it occurs at those energy levels that we can't see in subluminal space. Uh, some constants like these probably aren't. Uh, you know, they might be, uh, you know, as well as others, they may have evolved over time and in our local region of the universe may be what they are, but in some other region of the universe maybe not because the space-time density is very different. Um, the SEQ I'm thinking is going to be able to describe protons, neutrons, quarks to make every fundamental particle and um, you know, this will be a jump for joy for me if they actually find this stuff. Closing information. Uh, not much to go on here. I know Heidi's standing up, so I'm, I'm trying to rush through this. All this is conceptual, graphical, topological, model, lots of hand waving, lots of air quotes, lots of speculation. That's my game. Um, Let's see, uh, pretty much some of the space time may exist in different phases, trans space method of FTL travel, which is what we were going to talk about a little bit, which we didn't get to. Uh, summary number two, dark matter is superluminal mass that manifests itself as repulsive uh, gravitational energy is simply the repulsive effect of dark matter on our universe. It's pushing our universe apart. It's the same thing. It's the same cause. Uh, black holes are basically like choke flow systems in space, which is kind of interesting. Again, another fluidic analogy where you have a choke flow between the two spaces. Whatever can't get through the hole gets sent back. There's the jets. Okay. Um, Science desperately needs new approaches to this. Uh, fluidic space again, uh, alternate space if we're going to do any kind of FTL travel. And finally, open minds and the defiance of convention and lots of rotten uh, tomatoes and rodents and getting thrown at people are the essential for advancement of technology. All right. Uh, this is one of my favorite things I like to show uh, based on, you know, there's always going to be skeptics. And how many of you have seen this, this chart before, these kinds of things? Okay, yeah, you've seen this. Uh, in 1903, the New York Times, we, uh, you know, said that basically we're never going to fly unless 1 to 10 million years of research by people like you, mathematicians and experimentalists, make it so. And on that very same day, the Wright brothers said, we started assembly today. <laughs> okay? So there's always going to be skeptics. Okay? I thought that this was a fascinating, you know, real-time history type of thing. Uh, and then some inspirational quotes. Basically, you know, some of our dreams seem impossible, then improbable, then when we someone them, they become inevitable. I thought that was a great quote by the late actor Christopher Reeve. And uh, you've kindled a fire and we shall not let it die out, but we'll bend every effort to make the greatest dream of mankind come true. That was Herman Oberth talking to Tsiolkovsky about sending a man to orbit. So, and we, we, we do that very routinely now. And so, thank you for your attention. And that was a great quote oh. about um, a heavier than air flight, going to be impossible. Oh, yeah. By either orbital or or right, or, um, before. They were having a really bad day that day, but they said that's thing to do. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> so, yeah, you can email me here and I'll be happy to send you the talk.